Okay. So, hello everybody. Thank you for coming. I guess most people in this room have know about or have at least heard some things about free software and how successful it is today. Uh, and when you compare it to what the industry is doing, I think it's pretty obvious that Linux is a very successful operating system compared to, let's say, Microsoft Windows, which BSODs on ATMs, which is quite funny. But when you look at uh, what's available in the hardware world, most hackers play with basically microcontrollers and LED blinky stuff, nothing really advanced. And when you compare that to what the industry is doing, well, it's pretty obvious to me that there is a big elephant in the room and that all uh, open source hardware projects are nowhere near uh, doing any sort of this chip design. Now, obviously, you don't need such an advanced factory to design a chip at all. This factory is for making chips by the million. But still, I still think we have a problem with hardware in the hacker community. So, to address this problem, five years ago, I started a project called Milky Mist, which is what I'm going to talk today about. And Milky Mist develops, uh, for, for starters, they develop an open source system on chip design. So what I mean with a system on chip is uh, a set of uh, peripherals, which is integrated in one chip, which uh, in, contains a CPU, a CPU core, and uh, then lots of peripherals all around. That's typically what you have in mobile phone, for example. In mobile phone, you would have an, a CPU, which is typically an, an ARM device. And uh, the CPU connects to all sorts of stuff, like a new art or a GSM based bond processor, or a SIM card controller, a memory SD-RAM controller. That's also what you have in boards like the Beagle board, for example. You have one chip on it, which implements all the functionality of the Beagle board. I think uh, everyone knows about the Beagle board, right? Or, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, that's basically one chip which does everything. And in this chip, you have the CPU and in in integrated buses and some peripherals. Basically, it's, it's a computer on a chip. When you have a computer like that, you have the CPU with a discrete chip made by Intel, typically, still these days, unfortunately, because x86 is not the best instruction set in the world. Uh, and uh, you have a PCI bus and uh, then peripherals, which these days they tend to be dropped into one uh, North Region South Bridge chips. But still, they are more like discrete chips. And system on chip is uh, everything in one chip. But basically what is used in embedded uh, devices like iPad, iPhones, things I mentioned. So, the, one of the goals of this Milky Mist project was to develop such a system on chip uh, using open source design techniques. Uh, well, so that means uh, all the design files was for this nice system are available under, under the GPL license, are actually available today, they work. And uh, what do we have in here? So we have uh, a little overview of the, of the system. We have the CPU here. It's a, Miko 30, it's, a, it's a Miko 32 CPU. That's actually the only part that we didn't develop in this project. Uh, it's a CPU core which was made by the Lattice Semiconductor for use in their FPGAs. And uh, they have released it under an open source license which resembles the BSD license, but it's not exactly BSD license. And using this uh, CPU core as a base which makes approximately 20% of the lines of code of the complete Milky Mist system, we have built this uh, complete uh, design, which includes a memory controller for NOR, for SD-RAM. Uh, it includes uh, basic peripherals, like uh, uh, you have USB, you have a, a serial port, you have GPIO, basically what you expect on a microcontroller. And then you have more specialized peripherals, like, uh, for example, an audio controller. Uh, infrared, integrated MIDI, integrated DMX. The DMX is a protocol for controlling stage lights. And uh, I'll get back to that a bit later, why we have such uh, weird stuff integrated in the system on chip. Uh, we also have a video input uh, controller that uh, takes uh, BT656 video. It's a digital video format which is used by uh, chips which, uh, con which digitize PAL or SECAM uh, analog SD video and uh, do all the nasty processing and put out a, a better, uh, a better uh, a signal which is easier to process. It's a standard. Uh, okay, so we have all, and we have some accelerate, some compu computation acceleration here as well. These two guys here are, yes? Sorry? Yeah, NTSC worked as well, but actually uh, the BT656 uh, standard 
is, uh, trans is uh, transparent UV standards. The decoding between NTSC or PAL SECAM is happening before the BT656. And then uh, it doesn't really matter if you have PAL SECAM or NTSC. Uh, there, are, there, are, there are some differences because the refresh rate is not the same, but the basic uh, BT656 protocol is exactly the same. With just a small difference in timings that is very easy to take care of. You don't have to do all this uh, messy signal processing yourself with all the legacy. Well, signal processing is interesting, but uh, really PAL, SECAM, and TSC is really, there's really a lot of legacy, and if you want to accept signals coming from all sorts of uh, sources, which can have some noise, which can have some other distortion, which can be interlaced or not interlaced, it's really a mess. So it's pretty nice to have a little chip which takes care of this little legacy mess for us. That's why we didn't want to develop this part as open source, even though it would be a, a relevant thing to do. So, uh, yeah, so except the processor and IO peripherals, we have some accelerators. Uh, we have an accelerator in here called the PFPU, it's pro pro programmable floating point unit. Uh, it's basically something which is analogous to a vertex shader that you have in graphics cards. So what it does is you put a set of equations and it evaluates them very fast. And the uh, TMU, TMU is uh, basically a graphics pipeline. It's a 2D graphics pipeline with some other restriction. It means texture mapping unit. It is a bit more than texture mapping, but uh, that's basically when you are uh, drawing some polygons in OpenGL, uh, and then the graphics card takes care of it, and the TMU implements a subset of OpenGL. So we developed all this uh, as an open source license system on chip, and uh, now comes the question, how do you do such a thing? Well, it's just basically just logic design. I think this might be uh, this might be something that you know about, Nixie Clock. It's a very popular project uh, for people who do electronics. And this Nixie Clock is actually not using a microcontroller. A lot of people these days use AVRs for Nixie Clocks because AVRs have become very cheap and very powerful. But this one particular one didn't use any microcontroller. Instead of using microcontrollers, it uses basic logic gates, which you see here. They are, uh, CMOS or TTL logic gates. And uh, all the functionality of the Nixie clock is just implemented with logic gates and flip plots. So when you take that to the next level, you can build actually complete CPUs with that. So that's actually a CPU built with TTL logic gates. As you can see, it's pretty heavy. And when you look what's inside, it's an even bigger mess. You see with all these wires and all that stuff. So when you are designing this, what you have to do is pick chips manually. You, you need to think about the functionality of your CPU. Then you have to decide what sort of TTL chips or CMOS chips that you want to use. Uh, CMOS chips come with uh, various sets of logic gates. So you need to optimize. Put one chip can uh, use different uh, functionality of the CPU because let's say you have a chip which has eight uh, AND gates in it. And of course, you want to distribute these AND gates in different parts of the CPU. So you have to do that manually. Then you have to find a layout for the chips, and then you have to connect all the wires together, and it creates one big mess like that. So if we were to design the milk image system on chip using such technique, which is possible, uh, it would really require a lot of manual work. It would probably be a machine which is the size of this table, and uh, it would be pretty slow because you have all these delays over routing in the different wires. So to address the first problems, uh, modern chips and modern uh, logic designs use uh, what is called hardware description languages. So there is uh, VHDL or Verilog, they are the most prevalent languages these days. And uh, what you would do is dec describe the behavior of your logic using uh, a simple algorithmic description. Like, for example, uh, you can have variables and then you can assign a logic equation to that variable. You can have conditionals. Uh, and uh, when you put that into the software, it will process all the conditionals and uh, logic equations into uh, into whatever you want. Actually, it can be uh, it can be uh, TTL it, it can be TTL chips. It's, it, it is theoretically possible to develop a synthesizer which automatically partitions and selects TTL chips for you. But typically, when you have a logic design which uh, requires VHDL or Verilog. Uh, TTL chips are much way too small for doing such, for implementing such designs. So instead of having TTL chips, you just have uh, what is on the chip of the TTL chip. That is uh, what is called the standard cell in ASIC designs. It's uh, basically a, a pre-made 
pre-made semiconductor layout for, let's say, a D flip-flop or an AND gate or anything. And the synthesizer can pick, pick up uh, the correct gates from all this lab, pre-made library and use them to implement them, to implement your uh, behavior that you have written using VHDL or very log. And uh, so that's for making actual chips. But when, when you are making, when you are using an FPGA, uh, FPGAs uses they use uh, lookup tables instead of uh, instead of standard cells. So lookup table is just uh, well, it's just uh, a black box which can implement any let's say four or six input logic function with one output. And the synthesizer will partition your uh, big logic design into smaller uh, lookup tables which can later be programmed into an FPGA. And uh, after your uh, design has been converted into this set of standard cells or lookup tables, then comes the step of the placement. The step of the step of placement is very similar to uh, doing the well. It's just like placing the logic gate when you are doing this homebrew CPU. You have this breadboard, and you need to place the chips at the right position. Of course, if two chips are communicating together very closely, you need to put them very close to one another. And it's exactly the same problem when you are designing a chip or an, or an FPGA. When, the, when two standard cells or two lookup tables are communicating together, uh, it's a good idea to place them together, to place them close, so you don't have a lot of wiring and a lot of delays all over, all over the chip. And uh, the good thing is uh, there are tools which do that uh, more or less automatically. And when you are using this uh, synthesis flow, that's something which is, I would say, 99 or maybe 99.99% is of the placement is done automatically using a software tool, which, uh, well, it's, a, it's actually not very, not too complicated to develop such a tool. A lot of people think it's impossible. I don't think so. Uh, first, because com companies have done it, obviously, and I don't think open source developers are more stupid than engineers in companies. And uh, the techniques used are based on, it's basically an optimization technique. So you can use things like simulated annealing or some other heuristics based on function analysis to develop to, to, to develop an algorithm which gives a placement which is good enough and meets a set of constraints. So once you have placed your different logic gates on the surface of your chip, you need to connect them together. And that also is done automatically. When you have a chip, you need to draw metal bonds to connect all the, the pins of your logic gate together. And when you have an FPGA, uh, an FPGA you can route signals in an FPGA using what is called PIPs, which means programmable interconnect point. There are little, uh, little programmable switches inside the FPGA, uh, inside the FPGA chip, which connect, uh, two pre-made wires together. So it's like the old school phone networks when you have people connecting with jacks to different lines. It works exactly the same. You, you enable switches in the FPGA using, and, uh, you route all the signals through all the pre-made lines. That's just basically how it works. It's actually not something which is very complicated. It's just like designing a Nixie clock, but on a larger scale and with better tools. And as you might have noticed, the MidChemist chip has lots of funny interfaces and it has some graphic acceleration. Why do we have that? Because uh, one of the things we are developing is actually a video synthesizer. It's a device which uh, you see here. You can take a performer or dancer, any sort of object, you film, you film them, and it gets into the device and gets synthesized into all sorts of effects that you can program yourself. And you can control that with MIDI or DMX or, or whatever, or even OSC over Asanet, and that's why you have all this uh, stuff which is integrated into our FPGA. So, what have we done in five years? Well, we have actually designed the system on chip, which is implemented in the FPGA you see here. We have designed uh, a PCB layout for it. So we have manufacture, we are manufacturing our own PCB. We have mechanical layout. Well, basically, we have, we have a finished product. We have enough, some people manufacturing it. You can buy it online. It works. You can hook it up. Actually, some VJs are using it.
So this video here was made with this little device. It was made live from this uh, experimental 8-bit music you've heard. Uh, yeah, we don't have actually very good videos. That's one weak point that we have. We only have this small uh, screen and stuff. Hopefully, someday we'll have, we will shoot good videos. I hope. But yeah, people are actually using this stuff, and it, it, they can use it. They, that, this guy is actually not not a computer programmer. Well, he has some programming skill, but he's not a professional programmer, and he still manages to use it. Uh, if you look at Milchemist as, as an open from an open source project perspective, uh, we have 15 developers, 15 active developers, and if you want to put that into some perspective, I can refer you to this talk by uh, Benjamin McCohill, which is entitled uh, "When Free Software Isn't Better." And uh, it's actually a very interesting talk. And one of the points that he makes is that most open source projects are not as collaborative as most people think. If you look at uh, the breakdown of all source, of all source of projects by number of developers, you can see that most, the vast majority of projects have exactly one developer. And if you look at two developers, it's already a few, <laughs> a lot less, and the more you go, it drops down to zero very fast. And the Milkmist project is here. So I think it has been pretty difficult actually to get here, but we've made it and the project is pretty active now. We have people doing very interesting things with it, like, uh, uh, for example, people are porting the LLVM compiler to the MIKO32 architecture that we used in the first place. Right now we are using the GCC compiler, which has a number of problems. And uh, now we have an, an experimental LLVM port. Uh, we have people doing, what are they doing? Uh, someone contributed a QMU port. So if, when you want to develop software on the Milk image, you can develop it on your computer and emulate it with QMU. It, it will emulate the compute system and it will even forward the graphics acceleration operation to your GPU. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, we have people working on the MMU for the MICO32 processor. Right now it's a simple processor without a memory management unit. So you cannot run, you cannot basically do a lot of things which are nice to do with modern operating systems. And uh, someone is working on that now. Uh, we have people working on a, li on a Linux port. So right, right now it's UC Linux, which is a li Linux version which doesn't require an MMU. But uh, it's working today actually. You can boot a Linux on, uh, on the platform, including the frame buffer, the keyboard, all the stuff. It's a completely working Linux system. We have enough the open WRT distribution and build system to to make it easier to develop stuff on the Milk Chemist. Uh, it's working except that it has no MMU. And hopefully this will be addressed in the near future. Uh, right now this device doesn't use Linux, it uses an operating system called RTEMS, which was initially developed for the US military. Uh, yeah, the, in, the acronym initially stood for real-time system, uh, no sorry, real-time executive for missile systems. And uh, it has become open source, I think in 1995 or something like that. And uh, now it's missile was replaced by multiprocessors, and uh, now it's been used in all sorts of other projects. Uh, what else people are doing? Yeah, people are. We have U we have some USB on it, and uh, the USB is entirely controlled by the FPGA. Right now it's USB host ports, and someone is having fun trying to convert that into slave ports. You can do that because you can just program the FPGA and do whatever you want with it. All the USB signal processing is done, with, is done inside the FPGA. On the PCB, you have only uh, analog transceivers to adapt the signal levels. And then all the sampling and the signal generation is done by using the FPGA matrix. So it's a very flexible architecture. Yes? Uh, it's it's Xilinx. It's part and six. But uh, the code is uh, porta it's portable. Uh, I, I would say the vast majority of the code is entirely portable. Uh, we, uh, uh, yeah, so the, bus, the buses we are using, we are using the Wishbone bus, which is around the, C, around the CPU, we're using Wishbone. And then we have two custom buses that uh, I have developed specifically for this project. Basically, we did not want to use Wishbone for, it's the main area where, didn't, where we didn't want to use Wishbone was for the DDR SDRAM controller, because this uh, processing video requires a lot of memory bandwidth. And uh, Wishbone doesn't, at that time when I started the project, Wishbone didn't support pipelining. Now it does support some pipelining, but it's pretty hard to use. And uh, since I wanted pipelining and bursts as well, I just developed uh, my own bus, which supported both of these uh, 
optimization to have better memory boundaries out of, out of DDR S DRAM chips. Uh, yeah, I am. It's a DDR1, by the way. Well, right now, but we are going to switch to DDR3 in the next, in a few, probably in one year or something. DDR3 is pretty hard because uh, you have a very high clock rate. You have a very, you have a lot of serialization for the, between the DRAM core and the IO frequency. And uh, the current architecture cannot really deal with that very well. Uh, I'm going to talk about it very briefly later, but uh, I am in the process of completely refactoring the system on chip and uh, it will be possible to run the DDR at a multiple of the system clock frequency in, uh, with the next version of the system on chip, including, uh, and, and the memory controller will be able to reorder transactions and also uh, issue several uh, commands to the, to the DDR in, into one single clock cycle by just running multiple uh, state machines in parallel, each taking care of one of the DRAM banks. I don't know if it makes sense to you because uh, I don't know. Do you know about DRAM or? Uh, I, 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 I. Okay. And have you touched some DRAM already or? Yeah. Okay. So you know what I'm talking about, about banks and stuff like yeah. that. Okay. Uh, okay. So what was I saying? Uh, yes. Another contribution we got was uh, Uroshi tag uh, support for our FPGA. Actually, the complete, uh, there are some other people using uh, Uroshi tag to program FPGAs. Actually, this complete uh, FPGA support into our GTAG was initially developed by one of our developers. Uh, we also have a little uh, GTAG board. So it's, an, it's a hardware contribution that, that's interesting. But uh, I don't know if you have used the Xilinx GTAG tool already. Okay. Uh, I don't really know what the Altera tool is worth, but the Xilinx tool is horrible. It's very slow and proprietary. It takes several gigabytes. And uh, instead of that, we have Urgitag and our own small table. Do they, yeah, you have a question or any question? Yeah. Yeah. A VHDL simulator? Uh, our code is very low, so we don't have any VHDL yet. But why? Uh, of co but of course, we have a lot of simulation because uh, developing such uh, a system on chip requires lots of code, and you cannot just download it into the FPGA. And when it doesn't work, you don't have any visibility on it. So of course, we need to run a lot of simulation, a lot of test benches in order to fix all the bugs before they reach the FPGA. Because once they are in the FPGA, you cannot observe any signal which is inside the chip. Well, you can, but it's very difficult. So if you don't simulate it, you don't have visibility on your design and you cannot fix bugs. Uh, we use Icarus Verilog. It's an open source simulator. Icarus Verilog. So it's a mix of, we use Icarus Verilog and uh, GPL Siever. It's also an open source simulator. Yeah, Icarus, yeah. Uh, okay, so what was I saying? Uh, yeah, we actually, we, we haven't got some of our uh, developments, some of our IP, as some people say, in the industry. I don't really like that if we spelled IP, I would say logic core, because intellect, intellect, IP means intellectual property. It sounds like something which comes from the mouth of a lawyer and not an engineer. And uh, so I prefer to use the term logic core or gateway. So we got some of our logic cores into pretty interesting projects, like for example the Electro Software Defined Radio. You see it, it's in this little box here, and uh, it's an experiment by the NASA to develop a new communication systems, which is going to be put in the, on the ISS in July this year, and probably on the Mars Orbiter, but that's less certain, in, uh, which is going to be launched in 2014. So they are using actually the DRAM controller that uh, you mentioned earlier. Not the one which is a serialization, the current one. So, now I'm going to talk about what we are going to do next into this project. Because even though it's a pretty nice project already, it still has a lot of limitation and it can be improved a lot. I would say it's probably just the beginning of a lot of things. So, one of the first things we are going to, we are going to develop is uh, the mid-gen system. Right now we are using Verilog, and Verilog is not very good uh, to develop complex designs like this uh, next generation memory controller. So we are going to use Python as, uh, to develop the next version of the system on chip. So uh, MyGen is a Python library to, which makes it possible to apply modern software concepts such as object-oriented and metaprogramming to design hardware. So this enables more automation. You can make your designs more flexible, more parameterizable. And uh, then you have a host of uh, libraries to build from a higher level description. Uh, banks of configuration of, and status register, uh, interrupt controllers. So, for example, you would just you, you are just able using a mid-gen system. 
you can just give a list of uh, signals which should be treated as interrupt sources, and then it will automatically uh, connect this interrupt to the CPU, and then generate registers for uh, enabling the interrupt, uh, uh, querying status of the interrupt, or masking the interrupt entirely automatically. You don't have to type uh, all the code to generate that register automatically. It can generate bus interconnect automatically as well. Uh, right now, if you have several peripherals to connect to the wishbone bus, for example, using the of VHDL, it's really a pain. You need a lot of manual coding. There are some tricks in VHDL. They don't work in Verilog, but there are some tricks in VHDL using functions to be able to build flexible interconnect using functions and records and record arrays. You can do that in VHDL. You cannot in Verilog. But either way, it's a mess. And when you are using Midgen, all you have to do is uh, you are using the object-oriented capabilities to... Uh, you just have to give a list of bus objects that you want as masters on your bus. You give a list of slave objects and you're done. It automatically interconnects the complete stuff. And uh, another area which uh, uh, we are working at the moment on Majin is uh, data f synthesis of data flow systems. So data flow system is uh, basically a, a graph of uh, actors. An actor is something which performs an operation like a multiplication or anything more complex. It can be anything. It can even be something which accesses system memory. And uh, it, uh, you would give the, this data flow description of an algorithm, and MyGen will be able to develop automatically some uh, other implementation of it. That's something which is work in progress now. It doesn't work so well today. There is some code which does it, but it doesn't do it well. And it's more like Blue Sky's research today. And uh, MyGen is actually something that uh, we develop in collaboration with uh, the Reno platform project. It's a project from the University of Cape Town in South Africa. It is... Uh, basically a platform for doing software-defined radio. So you see here there is an FPGA, it's a Spartan 6 LX150, uh, which it has an uh, AVR processor, uh, no, sorry, uh, an ARM, ARM system on chip. And uh, the ARM system on chip runs Linux, and then it communicates with the FPGA, and the FPGA can implement interfaces to go to the ADCs that you see here. And it can also implement some uh, hardware acceleration to process uh, the signals, and that's where they're going to use this mid-gen data flow system to generate more easily the hardware accelerator for the radar processing, for the radar signal processing elements. And uh, yeah, it does a lot of fancy stuff like Ethernet, USB, well, all the stuff which comes with the ARM system on chip, basically. So, another field of possible application for the Milky Way system on chip is uh, this little cute laptop. How many of you have heard of it, by the way? Of the NanoNod? One person? No one else? Okay. So actually, the NanoNod is, uh, is this little small laptop. It's really the size of uh, a cone of coke. And it's manufactured by the same people who manufactured the Milky Mist. Right now, it is based on uh, a proprietary system on chip uh, using a MIPS CPU. And uh, we are thinking about switching it to the Milky Mist system on chip design. Maybe after the MMU is done, so it can run fully fledged Linux. And uh, this, might, uh, uh, this might mean that we are going to switch uh, from FPGA to ASIC. So I would say economic economically, it might not make, make a lot of sense to switch to ASIC because that's still, a small, uh, that's still a small product. So it's going to be more expensive, definitely, but ASIC still remains pretty affordable. You can have a small series for like $10,000, uh, something like that. So it's going to be more expensive than Genic, but it's also a learning experience, and I think some people, some free software advocates, or some people who are interested in playing with architecture, are probably going to be willing to pay a bit more to have this free system on chip. I'm not saying we are going to sell a lot, and uh, it's going to be relatively more expensive, but if you want to learn about chip design, or I think it's a great project to do anyway. And this brings me to the next uh, Milky Mist video synthesizer, what we are going to do next for the main Milky Mist video product. Well, we are going to basically do what everyone, what everyone is doing these days, just increase res resolution, have more video outputs. Well, pretty boring stuff, everyone's doing that, but everyone wants that at the same time. Uh, we are going to use what I talked about earlier, this MyGen uh, synthesis system in Python to build the complete system on chip. Maybe we are going to switch to ASIC as well, but not, not entirely sure. Because what I like as well as a Milky Mist video synthesizer, it's, it is a very experimental product. People can do whatever they want with the FPGA, change the complete design. And we would lose that if we switch to ASIC. And, uh, well, or maybe we can just have two chips. If we, if we switch the nanonode to the Milky Mist system on chip, we can have the CPU in one chip and the FPGA doing the rest. 
And uh, this actually brings a lot of performance advantage because FPGAs have one big problem, is they are very inefficient. Uh, these days, when you have a mobile phone which runs at 100 gigahertz, it's not because they have made such a good uh, design in VHDL or Verilog, and uh, we have made a bad design because it runs only at 80 megahertz in the Milky Mist. It's because FPGAs are just uh, extremely slow compared to ASIC technologies. In your mobile phone, you have directly, let's say, 28 nanometer transistors, and these are really fast compared to a slow FPGA like we have in here. And that's what, that's what makes the difference between 1 gigahertz and 80 megahertz in the Milky Mist. Actually, I did try uh, implementing the CPU core in the Milky Mist into an ASIC process, and then run a timing analyzer on it, because actually, uh, you can also determine the running frequency of your design using software techniques. So you don't need to build the chip and try how fast it runs. There are models which predict that. And I tried to do it for the Milky Mist design. And if you use uh, 90 nanometer uh, technology, which is already pretty old these days, it runs at 800 megahertz. So it's definitely not a problem with the very long design. It's just a problem that FPGAs are stupidly slow. And another uh, area of interest that we are going to explore is changing the, is really the user interface. These days, the user interface of the Milky Mist is, well, I don't know, I wouldn't call it bad, but it would call it mediocre, uh, especially because you have to switch between programming mode and uh, visualization mode. And a lot of people don't get that or don't like experimenting, switching values and then switching between modes. It's pretty difficult for a lot of people to comprehend, which is understandable. So we want, really want this product to be usable by everyone and unleash their creativities. So we are going to make a lot of effort in the near future developing what is called a tangible user interface. So what I mean, I think I find this project pretty ins inspir inspiring the React table. It's uh, uh, one table, you will see it in the video. We put object on the table and it makes sounds. I pretty much like this project with this user interface with based on just physical interaction. And uh, I'm thinking about doing it the same, but with video. And uh, I would also like to... This uh, this design is actually very bulky. 
because it works with a video projector which is under a table. It's approximately TV size, in fact. And uh, you have a video projector under the table, uh, which uh, projects this image that you see. And uh, the objects are detected because they have a little symbol on them. And uh, there is infrared lightning on, under the table as well. And then a webcam just processes the image. It's very simple. But the problem is that it's extremely bulky, so you cannot really transport it. It's pretty bad for that. And I would like to develop something like that, but uh, using radio frequency instead of infrared. And that would probably make it possible to make a small tablet, which is also interactive in this way. And uh, I would do it probably by using the same principle as Wacom tablets, which is uh, having sending a, a signal like RFID into a, into, the, into a pen or some smart object, and then sensing the return signal using a, a grid of printed calls on a PCB and uh, determining the peak of the signal, which gives the position of the object. And uh, so it has two advantages. First, it is uh, it can be made into a tablet, which is this thick and not a big table like that. And the uh, second advantage is uh, the objects can be smart. Here you only have uh, a piece of uh, plastic with a symbol on it, and it cannot interact or anything. If we use radio frequency, we cannot buttons, we cannot gyros, accelerometers, all sorts of stuff that we want into the objects. So it opens a lot more possibilities than just a rectangle. table. Right, so if you want to learn more about this project, uh, feel free to come to our IRC channel, Milchemist on Freenode. Uh, it's there are always people on it. If you have any technical questions or anything, go to the channel or just ask me. I will be in the room later. Uh, we have a mailing list, of course, and you can follow us on Twitter. And before the demonstration, I would just like to advertise a little bit a conference that I'm, I am organizing in Berlin, in Germany. Uh, I know Germany is pretty far from here. I come from I come from there, so. I know it's far, but uh, EHSM, Exceptionally Hard and Soft Meeting, is going to be in December, uh, 20 to 30. And it's about the most, basically the most uh, hardcore DIY and open source hardware and software that you can find. Like people uh, building uh, particle accelerators, cyclotr cyclotrons, uh, let's say vacuum tubes. Uh, there are actually people who are trying to build chips. I mentioned chip design at the, at the beginning. And there are actually people who are working on that. Uh, they are going to be invited to this conference too. Uh, we have people. We, have, we are going to have fun. Stuff. Actually, we, are, we haven't made the program yet. We have just managed to book the rooms like two days ago. That's why I'm just announcing it now, and you will you will not find anything on the website yet. But if you follow us on Twitter, you will be able to get updated when we get really public about this, about this event. So I think if you don't have any questions, I can plug this thing, and uh, we will see what it's doing. Uh, we are using the Lattice Micro 32 CPU core, which uh, wasn't designed by us, but all the rest it was custom designs. Because uh, there, are, there is some stuff on opencores.org, but most of it is extremely buggy and extremely bloated, so we tried using some and it didn't work. Uh, it was basically a waste of time because I tried using it and I just figured out that it was completely buggy and broken by design, so I ended up regretting everything. In a lot of cases, I haven't, I haven't really benefited from opencores.org. Sorry? Uh, yes. Yep. No, no, it's, a, it's actually a BSD style license. Well, if you, if you look at this in the strictest sense of the free software license, you could say it's not open source because, not because the Lightis, uh, wanted to close it down, but because the Lightis license has this stupid uh, US export restriction uh, on it. And because of that, it contradicts the open source period. But that's the only problem that we have with the Lightis uh, Miko license. Yes? With what? The Altera? Uh, how, how do you call it? Ah, Acronix. Acronix, no, we are not. Uh, actually, Acronix FPGAs are extremely expensive and they're not finished out for this market. They are using telecommunication appliances. And uh, one Acronix chip is several thousand uh, dollars. And I, I don't actually know how fast they run, because Acronix is a very quite secretive company, compared to Xilinx or, or Altera, where you can just download their stuff and try it for yourself. And uh, I don't even know if the Acronix claims are true, because I have never seen them in action. Sorry? Yeah, but you see lots of stuff in advertisement. Yeah. 
Yep. Oh, uh, yeah. uh, I, have a, I have another presentation about that that I gave in October. And uh, we have, I don't think we have time, but uh, if you want, I can go to the breakout room if you have a video projector. Do you have a video projector in the breakout room? No? Okay, uh, anyway. Uh, today there are no free software to develop this, but uh, I think it is totally possible to develop it and reverse engineer the bitstream formats. And uh, yeah, if you look at the, I think I have a few slides. I can show you a few, few slides, maybe. But actually, they, they, do they do publish a lot. Uh, let me just find it again. They do publish a lot. Uh, yeah, if you, what is that? No, that's not the right one. Ah, yeah. So if you look at for this presentation that I made. Uh, so that was a presentation that I made in October about building uh, open source uh, FPGA synthesis tools. And uh, actually, if you look at the bitstream format, you can find a lot of documentation in the in, uh, in from, which is published by the FPGA vendors, which a lot of people are surprised to, to learn about that. But you can find a lot of you can find, for example, a complete uh, uh, list of the pips which are programmable, programmable interconnect points from the gradient chips just by running the tools with the right options. Uh, and if you look at how it's encoded in the bitstream, so yeah, that would be a PIP, for example, it's just a pass transistor, which would connect this thing with this wire here, with the output when it's switched on. And when you look at how it's done in the bitstream, uh, basically it's just uh, a, a group of two bits that you see here. So you switch on this transistor just by setting the bit to one, very simple, and you set the other transistor here just to switch, uh, just to switch it on as well. And this connects this to this. And if you want to know where this is connected, to which LUT is connected, you can also find that in the documentation from the, from the FPGA vendors. So it's actually not a big obstacle that, uh, uh, FPGA vendors are not documenting a lot of details in the, of the bitstream research. It's just a problem of people being lazy. To do what? Yeah, that's what my journey is about. Well, I, at least the data flow part. The data flow system is inherently parallel. Yeah. So, uh, uh, right now, the uh, uh, Actually, we, we are able to run the user interface in 1024 times uh, 7600, yeah. And uh, it doesn't work in rendering mode yet because of uh, memory bandwidth problems that I'm going to address in the next version of the system on chip. Uh, you have uh, some. Uh... Oh, actually, you can you can do it. No, it, it works as well without the transceivers. This uh, Spartan six chip we are using today uh, is capable of doing uh, HDMI and DVI. And in the next, in the very next PCB version, which is actually being manufactured right now, it's being rooted actually at the moment. Uh, we are going to have uh, replaced VGA with DVI. So and you will have DVI-D. So it is possible to do it with minor changes to the current design. No, 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 no. They are not, they are not more expensive anyway. Okay. No further questions. I can plug it in. Okay. Actually, there might be a video recording available from this presentation on FPGA tool chains. And I don't know when they're going to publish it because they're pretty slow about that. But if you look it up, maybe it will come out someday. So we'll see all the details. So let me plug this thing on. Of course, yeah. 
Uh, actually, I think I think I might just show some Magian code instead because this version of the device has a bug which prevents startup until in certain temperatures and other parameters. And I think we have just hit the right spot where it doesn't work. This is fixed in the next version of the PCB, of course, but I can turn it on. It is working now. So this is one of the, we know this bug that you have just in took us two months to fix. It was very frustrating. Sometimes it just didn't turn on. It was just some problem with the flash signals, which uh, prevented the FPGA from running the, f reading the flash at startup at some point. But just a lot of pain to fix it. All details like that in the design. So. That's actually, that is actually running on the, on the FPGA. All the video signal is generated in the FPGA. And even show some settings that will be converted to CPU and everything. So, let's see if the camera is working. Yeah, it is. So, not a little camera. That's one of the effects you can do using the camera as source. So this is processed live on the FPGA. <laughs> so you have a lot of possibility of interaction. I'm not going to show them today because I don't have time. But if you connect a MIDI controller on it with sliders and stuff, you can tune the zoom or add borders or change colors or do lots of things. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah. So actually, uh, what, I've, what I have just shown is just written by, you just made by these seven lines of code that you see here. Yeah. Yeah. And if you connect a USB keyboard to the MIDI you can edit this code here. So you can make your own, you can make your own very easily, or you can just download them from the internet and connect them and transfer them to FTP. Yeah, yeah. These are just various parameters for the video. Uh, what else? We can interact with sound as well. I'm not going to show it either, but uh, with sound. You can synchronize that to sound, change the zoom. Yeah. No, it has, it's not. It's not based on. It's not based on an NVIDIA language. It is based on Mildrop. Mildrop is an audio visualization plugin for Winamp, and that's what we use as a base for uh, the, this programming language. We don't use any existing Mildrop code now. Yeah, yeah. Actually, a lot of these uh, these uh, scripts are I imported from Mildrop. Yeah, uh, I'm looking for another one which I can find now. Uh, Ah, yeah. Maybe this one. This one uses, this one is generative, it doesn't use any camera. And it reacts to sun, so when I'm tapping a little bit on the box, it's just gonna. Yeah, 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 you can just edit this code and you can change a lot of parameters from there. Uh, I'm looking for another one with a camera, but I can't find it. Uh... Ah, this is just. Yeah, that's another one using the camera and putting some pretty heavy distortion on it. Yeah. What? Yep. Yeah. yeah, but if you if you want to use a, if you want to take the user interface, you can switch it to higher resolution. Yeah, yeah. I think it does. Yeah. But that's only for the user interface. If you, when you are, when you are rendering something, it switches back to VGA resolution. Because we, we don't have enough memory bandwidth to do the, to do this resolution in rendering now. But it's basically a problem of the memory controller. We can clock the DRAM higher, and we can have a more efficient access pattern to memory by using transaction reordering. And that's what we are going to do with the next version of the system on chip. And then you will be able to do this resolution and then maybe even more. Sorry? Uh, oh, no. 
Yeah, of course. I mean, what else? Well, I Actually, open cores, are, open cores as an Ethernet Mac, which works, which is rare enough to be mentioned. Yeah. But it just, it just works. I mean, but it's pretty bloated and, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's actually bigger than LM42. So you have the Ethernet Mac for open cores is bigger than our CPU. And uh, Michael. Oh, Michael. Michael, yeah. Okay, so I think it's time. Thank you for your attention. Does it have like a microphones in there? Oh, it's inside, yeah.